Bill Kearns. Uh, we'll start here, we'll go down through. Uh, what this one is, is a uh, black wildebeest that come from South Africa. And uh, we got several different South African stuff, so we'll start with yeah. that one. And then this one here is a uh, red hearted beast. It's a South African uh, also that we shot when we was down there hunting. Okay, let's go ahead and get this. This is one of the other South African ones. It's a, uh, uh, space it out here, uh, Elan, which is about a 1,200 pound, such matter in that neighborhood, size-wise. Uh, that's another one we took when we was in South Africa. Then we'll go over to this. This is a uh, blessed buck. It's a, what they call a common blessed buck. Uh, the common, and then we'll go to a white. They, uh, those were South African. They all cut, run kind of together in the same herd. And this is the other blessed buck that runs with the common one. Uh, they're just pretty much uh, run together in the same herds. This one here is an uh, Impala. Uh, we shot those again down in South Africa. The one on the left here, that's a uh, common, what they call a common spring buck. Um, and then they have the other one, the head that's mounted here, that's what they uh, have a, what they call a black spring buck that you can hunt down there as well. The one on the right is a mountain reed buck. And then uh, while we're in here, that uh, that's just a mule deer from this part of the country. This one here also is a mule deer. That's the first mule deer I shot with a muzzleloader. There's another set of horn up there. In there. Okay. There's here's some hides from some of the South African. That's a uh, wildebeest. We got several different hides hanging around. All right, let me get a good pan in here. Let's start on some of these skins and furs you got here, Bill. Uh, these are just coyotes. Uh, they're tan, different coyotes. Then uh, most of the fox are, uh, not all the fox, but most of them are ranch fox. The ones hanging around on the walls are a lot of ranch fox. The big dark one there, the black one, that's an uh, Alaskan wolf. Well, we went through most of the fox, coyotes. There's some uh, mouflon sheep, some caribous that are tan. Go ahead and pick those up and bring them over uh, there towards, towards you. That's a mouflon sheep. Here's a caribou. <clears throat> and then there's other hides laying around. Most of the ones on the tables are uh, 
black, what they call black beaver. Uh, they're like these, which they consider those what they're, they're smaller, they're just, uh, instead of being the brown color, they're the blacks, which is a lot more desirable for colors. Let's see. You want yeah. to start? Let's go ahead and start on your African work. Let's start on that zebra down there. Oh, okay. That's a zebra that was shot that in South Africa as well. Um, then we can go over. We'll finish up the South Africa stuff. This is a uh, gims buck. Come out of South Africa as well on that hunt. This and over on the other side is a kudu from South Africa. Um, here's a uh, warthog that we shot in South Africa as well. That's pretty much all of the uh, South African stuff that we shot. Well, you can't, yeah. You can't really see these. It gets a little dark over there. Yep. That help? Yeah. There's skunks, uh, foxes, badgers, uh, otters, fishers, and of course alcorns. Different sets of alcorns. Some of them are up. Some are not all finished. There's some other sheep skulls, different sheep skulls back there. <clears throat> you now those are the ones you're hiding, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Got too much junk in the way. That's pretty much most of the uh, hides. I got some more in the boxes over there. Okay. Should have drug those out, I guess. Yeah, let me just kind of go ahead and open up that door again so I can just go ahead right. and kind of. Camera shot, huh? Yeah. How about explaining all those antelope horns over there? Well, those are the ones, uh, just the ones I've shot over the years. Oh, crop damage, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those are just the ones I've shot. Uh, didn't have room for all the heads or whatever and set the horn mounts, and so I just started putting them all on boards. Well, there's quite a few. And I got, I think, three more to go on them boards that are... Wow. There's, uh... There's 20 sets there on those boards now, and I got three more sets to go on. Man, that's pretty good. Good. Over here. You got wolf over there? Yeah, that's Alaskan black wolf. Cool. Well, let's talk about Africa. You want to tell us your story? Yeah. Uh, well, there's not a lot to it other than... Uh, there was four of us that went down originally, the first, and we went down for to hunt with a guide, and uh, so we went down there. 
we flew down to Cape Town and then uh, uh, the outfitter, the guide, he picked us up in Cape Town and then we drove about 10 hours up to his uh, ranch where we hunted at some and stayed. Um, and we stayed at a little house that was about, oh, about 50 miles from a little town that was probably a population of, oh, maybe a hundred. And uh, we stayed out there and that's where we hunted. That was our base camp. We hunted on it. And we hunted there, the four of us hunted there with two different guides, Hine and Peter. And um, then after hunting there for about a week, we left, Marvin and I left, and we went with Hine up to uh, another hunting camp, which was up what they consider in the bush country. And we hunted for a week up there. At that part, that area is where we hunted the kudu, the warthog, impalas, and... Uh, we stayed in there for about a week, hunted, and then we come back to the original ranch and hunted an additional week. Uh, mm -hmm. Bruce and Brett, who went with us the first, they had only hunted, they stayed there two weeks, they hunted down at the base for two weeks. Uh, <clears throat> but it was a pretty good hunt. We'd uh, you get up in the morning and they'd feed you and pack you a lunch. And, you get your guns ready and you go around the corner and honk the horn and the black jumps in the back and away you go. And you get out there and you uh, you hunt mostly all private ranches. Everything's pretty much private ranches, but uh, everything is pretty much in a game fence. But then the smallest ranch we hunted was uh, like 700 acres in one, one fence. Uh, so it's not like they're fenced right in right in front of you. And so it's pretty interesting. Uh, and then if you get, you know, if you're hunting that day, whatever species you're hunting, if you get them, well then uh, it's pretty good because uh, they, uh, you don't really have to do anything. They're black, they'll, they'll gut it out, they'll do all the work, they'll load it. You can help them, of course. And then you get back to camp, you, uh, they unload it in a garage thing, and the blacks, they go to work skinning and fleshing, and you can go over and sit by the fire and drink beer till supper's ready if you want. So it works out pretty good. I remember you told me that one story about uh, it was in the morning when you guys were getting up uh, when you first got there. It was, it was like for breakfast and you really didn't know what to expect. You didn't know what mm -hmm. type of food was going to be out there. So you decided to go ahead and start munching. Then it all started. Yeah. Would well, you go ahead and tell us yeah. about that? The first morning we were there, we, were, we go into a room that had two pretty good long tables. And uh, we get in there and there's orange juice, milk, coffee, uh, apple juice, and then there's a bunch of dried food or dried stuff like cornflakes, dried cereals. And then there's a bunch of apples and oranges and grapes and bananas and everything sitting there. So we picked down on that stuff, thought it was pretty good, and then uh, about the time we got done with that, then here come breakfast. That was when they brought the ham and the eggs and the, all the other stuff out. And so it was quite a shock to uh, be fed and, and taken care of that good. Um, they do an excellent job. Um, and then, like I say, they pack you a lunch. You get to take a lunch. Um, when you get back to camp toward evening, uh, you go over and sit by the fire and drink beer or whatever or pop and sit around the fire and wait till supper's ready and they cook a bunch of steaks and they'll bake pies and cakes and I mean, you think you're going down there and lose some weight, you ain't losing no weight, I guarantee you. You may walk a lot and cover a lot of ground, but uh, the hunting is just unbelievable. A uh, lot of game, lots of game. What caliber? Mostly, you, you I know, use. Everybody two, use. I use 243 and a 7 mag, yeah. and that's plenty. Um, use the 243 on the smaller stuff, and then like on the kudu and stuff, you can use a 7 on it. Uh, zebra stuff like that. The bigger game. Uh, you can use a bigger gun if you want. Um, and most of your shooting, just about all of your shooting, if you'd average it out, is 200 yards plus. Is just about all of your shooting. Um, you may get a 150 yard shot or a 100 yard shot, but just, and you'll shoot some 400 yard shots. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and some 450s, depending on what you're shooting and where you're at and whether you think you can shoot it. You know, if you don't think you can shoot it, then. 
you can try to get closer if you can. But the game is not, even though it's in a fence, it ain't tame by any means. Um, mm -hmm. We shot mountain reed buck, which is about the size of a, uh, oh, about the size of a greyhound dog. It's all the bigger they are. They don't have very big chest on them. Mm -hmm. Small. And I shot mine at about four and a quarter, and Marvin shot his at about four fifty, four sixty. And that's a long ways to be shooting at a little critter that small. That's but, true. Uh, but if you can shoot, you don't have a problem, you know. Um, and it's like most outfitters. Uh, the first morning we're there, uh, we go out and sight the guns in. And then we come back in and have a little lunch, and then we go out to hunt uh, spring buck. And we walked and walked and walked and walked for a long time, and we finally got on a come over a little rise and got onto a bunch of spring buck. And Marvin shot his at about 70 yards. We snuck right up on him on that little rise. But then they took off and they went to the other end of the ranch and then the other guy shot at him and they went to the other end of the ranch and then here come one down through the bottom all by himself. And he laid down out there at about 330 yards mm -hmm. and they're not much, they're small. Their neck's only probably that big around. They don't have, they're not a very small animal. And uh, so I told Hein, I'll just shoot him where he's laying. And Hein said, yeah, okay. So you just ease over to a rock and touch her off and drilled him dead center at about 330 yards. So after that, then Hein decided that if we wanted to shoot him, just go ahead and let us shoot him. <laughs> I guess he figured if we could hit it, we could shoot, or to see it, we could kill it. So worked out pretty good. But I know he's running into problems with the guys. Say, oh, yeah, I can shoot that, and they can't hit nothing. And yeah. So they scare all the game, and then it gets to be a problem. But he found out pretty early that we could shoot, so then it wasn't any problem. If we said, hey, they're close enough, let's just, which one do you want me, which one's the one to get? He'd point them out, and we'd just shoot them, and that was it. It was pretty simple. As far as the African taxidermy work's concerned, if you were to get that done stateside, oh. man, it'd be, it'd be absolutely outrageous, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, so as far as... Uh, yeah. Prices go to me, you know, a lot of the work that I've seen already, as far as African goes, you'd have at least eight or nine thousand dollars tied up in taxidermy work. Right. Just yeah. for that alone. Yeah. And then the shipping, because uh, uh, we had everything air freighted coming back. Mm hmm. And uh, so that adds, you know, quite a bit to it too, as well. Oh, sure. Just to getting it air freighted. Because you don't really want them <laughs> to ship it by boat. Uh, you know, it takes so long to get here, and they don't handle it like they do in air freight. Mm -hmm. And uh, to get them back without any damage to them. And we, we got all our stuff back. There was nothing that was damaged. They crated it real well, done an excellent job on ship packing it and shipping it. So, But then you got that. Then you got the cost of coming through customs with it. Mm -hmm. So there's other additional costs. So when you get all done, um, you know, you between your shipping and your uh, customs and all that, you can tack about another thousand on for this stuff to get it back mm -hmm. uh, by the time you pay all that other stuff. What about firearms? Things like that going through customs, going through airlines? Not a problem. Now, this is before 911. Wasn't it? No problem. No? Yeah. What, uh, it's, it's, what year uh, was this? Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Wasn't that long ago. It was after. It was before 9/11. Uh, but close. It would have been three years ago. Yeah, okay. Let's see. Uh, and it took us. But that's the thing too. It took us about a year to get our stuff back from the taxidermies. Uh, I've talked to guys who's had stuff down there for years and years and ain't never got it back. Mm -hmm. But you got to deal with a reputable guide. Mm -hmm. It's his responsibility to get it to the taxidermy and to get it taken care of and to get it back to you. Mm -hmm. And it's his part of his job. That's <clears throat> part of what you pay for. Mm -hmm. It's him to stay on the taxidermy and make sure it's done, make sure it's created, and make sure it's shipped. Mm -hmm. And if you deal with, you know, you may pay a little more money, but you deal with a good, reputable outfitter. Mm -hmm. And he should be dealing with a reputable taxidermy. And if he's not, then he's got his own problems. Mm -hmm. But whatever it is, it needs to be back. You know, you you just you know you can't go down there and spend that kind of money and hunt and and then not get your stuff back. 
it's you know. So in two thousand one, then you guys probably spent what about eleven, twelve thousand a piece for everything. Everything that you see that I got shipping yeah. back here, shipped, mounted, and shipped. Well, well she'd say airfare, uh, just for you, plane fare. Well, the plane fare, everything. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it all come out to where it was uh, about eleven four is what the total cost was for all of it. Yeah. Well, that's and not too bad. So you need to do that today. Shoot. <laughs> well, it'd be a little more. Oh yeah, it'd be uh, more. It'd more. be a lot more, probably. Uh, yeah. The other thing that uh, for replacement while you're there, uh, <clears throat> since we, Bruce and and Brett, I, Marvin, uh, we all hunt varmints quite a bit, so we was able to go out on night hunts a lot, uh, and you shoot jackals, you shoot caracals, you shoot. Uh, Spring hares, what they call spring hares, which is like a, like our rabbits, jackrabbit, but it's it looks just it got little front feet, big back feet, and it hops like a kangaroo, but it's a spring hare. They call it a rabbit type. Uh, you can shoot hundreds of those a night if you want. Uh, you can shoot fox, uh, ger uh, gentle. Uh, gosh, I'm trying to think what that other cat is, but. You can shoot a lot of stuff at night, and nobody, it's not a problem. They don't, have, you know. It's all legal over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And a hunting license at that time, when we went, the money exchange rate was seven to one. So uh, seven of their dollars for every one of ours. Right. You know, American money. Right. That's not bad. And it's a bit of, <laughs> yeah, now it's ten to one. Really? Yes. Wow. So it's a better deal yet. But when we went to get a, a, um, uh, <clears throat> Because you have to buy a hunting license to hunt, and a hunting license will cost you less than one dollar of our money to get a hunting license. Maybe we ought to take that down to the Division of Wildlife. And say, hey guys, yeah. <laughs> think about this. Yeah. But, money hungry people. <laughs> uh, they're real reasonable down there on their stuff, and then and I'm sure Hine, because I've talked to other people. Uh, the National Trappers sent down about 25 or 30 people. They went through with Hine on stuff. Uh, he's an excellent outfitter, um, and he takes care of the people. Uh, when we were there, and I don't know if he does it with everybody, but from what I can gather, he does. Uh, now I don't know has he done it with all 25 of the from the nationals, but if you was to go down an individual uh -huh. uh, or two or three guys, when we would travel from one place to another. Uh, when we left down between Johannesburg and Cape Town, when we drove up north of Cape Town and hunted, mm -hmm. if you stop along the freeway at what we call a loaf and jug, which is there, is very similar, uh, 7-Eleven, you want a pop, you want something to eat, he bought it all. He didn't buy nothing. I mean, nothing. Uh, of course, it's a little shocking when you go into the 7-Eleven and you see a can of Coke that says six ninety five on it. But then you figure that's seven to one. It's less than a dollar. It's the same same as ours. Yeah. But till but it takes a little while to to relate to everything. It's seven to one ratio. See. They'd uh, be picking me up off the floor like, my God, seven dollars. No, 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 no. Look at the exchange rate. You know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> right. So that's that's interesting. Uh, but once you're there for a little while, then you get to relating to it. You know. So then you'd recommend a trip to Africa to hunt. Oh yeah, in a minute. You uh -huh. bet. Uh, if you could go back, what would you hunt? Would you hunt the same thing, or would no. you go ahead and go for the big stuff, big we'd, cats? And we'd hunt some different stuff um, because you already got this, you know. So you sure. actually go to bigger stuff. And then two, since we were there, uh, at the time we were there, Hine was not certified to hunt Cape buffalo stuff like that. Since that time, he went and got certified to do all that. Now this here is the outfitter you're right. talking about, the guys. So yeah. now he's certified because you have to go through special schooling and and training and stuff to hunt what Cape buffalo and other mm -hmm. items, uh, lion, elephant. When to sacrifice your hunter to the animal and save your butt. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, they've since then he's went to school, uh, took the courses, passed, and he's certified for all that stuff now. Good. So if we was to go back, we would go back to hunt uh, other stuff. Sure. Uh, yeah. Other than what we've already hunted, you yeah. know, but there was quite a few species there that we didn't hunt that were there. Uh, not a lot. We could have hunted, uh, like on the black uh, wildebeest. We could have hunted blues. We could have hunted 
normal standard ones that you see millions of running across the plains and stuff. Uh, on the spring buck, they have a white one, a pure white one that they're hunting now that uh, costs a lot more money because they don't have very many right now, but you can hunt them. Uh, there's quite a few other things that you can hunt. Um, water bucks, uh, anolis, uh, there's a lot of that stuff that you can hunt, even in the areas where we were. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you know, like I say, if we went back, we'd probably go for something uh, quite a bit bigger, more in the Cape Buffalo lines and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, <clears throat> all I got to do is hit the lottery and we're gone. <laughs> I understand that. These things here cost money. So as far as uh, food goes, uh, accommodations and everything, you definitely recommend this, oh, yeah. this outfitter? Uh, the outfitter, the place where we stayed at was an old farmhouse. Been there for a lot of years it was uh, and they had uh, it was on part of what uh, Peter his folks ranch and they had fixed it up for to bring in hunters but it had a fireplace for heat and it had gravity for water off of a cistern thing off a hill and uh, that's all it had uh, but that was plenty what was the weather like over there all the time there we it's, went down you know. uh, the middle of May to the first of June that's their winter. Uh, we're starting summer, that's their winter. Uh, the weather in the morning should get up. Uh, down there where we were at, you would get up in the morning and about one out of four mornings or three, you'd have a light frost. Um, the rest of the time, and it'd warm up to 60, 70 during the daytime, which made it real nice hunting. Uh, when we went up to Johannesburg, north of Johannesburg, in the bush country and hunted kudu and stuff, it was considerable warmer uh, because you're getting closer to the equator, so it's warmer. Uh, you didn't have any frost. If you did, it was real light frost. It was very minimal. Uh, you had more dew in the mornings than you had frost. Uh, it was... Uh, what was the hottest temperature you guys ran into? Uh, probably 70. Yeah. It's about the hottest it got. And that's winter, uh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Think about summer. And uh, yeah, and it's uh, so it's ideal hunting. Uh, there's not any, you know, you don't have to have a lot of heavy clothes. Now at night, when you go out night hunting, if you're driving and you're riding in the back of the truck, and it get cool, you know, you'd want a pretty heavy jacket and stuff, you know. Uh, but that's that's the only time it really got cold, is at night when you're doing the night hunting. Uh, because you drive, you do a lot of driving uh, mm -hmm. with spotlights and stuff. Nobody. Don't you wish we could do that here? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Boy, that'd be good. <clears throat> they don't have a problem with that stuff down there. <clears throat> well, how, how about these birds? Oh. I heard a lot about birds. <laughs> yeah. One day we went over and we hunted uh, what they call rock pigeons. And we hunted those at a sunflower patch. Um, the guy had a circle pivot sprinkler system and he had the... Uh, sunflowers in there and so we we went to town and borrowed some shotguns from people at high new and stuff and we went out there and uh, drop, dropped us off all the way up and down the edge of the sunflower patch and then they'd drive up and down the other side of it and around in the truck just shooting them right out of the truck nobody cared you know mm. um, no it's legal they, yeah, yeah no big and deal on them around to us and so everybody shoot one and go by or two or whatever and then uh, we had some Egyptian geese fly over, and so they just shot a couple of them, no big deal. Um, anyway, we took all that stuff. Uh, we killed probably over 100 rock doves that day, uh, in an afternoon, actually. It was just in one afternoon we went out there. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the only actual bird hunting that we got to do. And the reason we'd done that was through, we'd already killed some other animals that morning, and so we said, well, we'll go bird hunting this afternoon. Mm -hmm. and and we hunted, they don't generally, down there, uh, with hind, they don't generally hunt on Sundays. Uh, they like to generally just take a day off and do nothing. Mm -hmm. But it's understandable. Marvin and I, we, when we hunt, we hunt. Mm -hmm. So we hunted every day was there. The only day we didn't hunt was when we was traveling up to Johannesburg to go to the bush country and, the, and then that night when we drove back. Um, so there's actually one day 
out of 21 days that we didn't hunt. Uh, we just hunted every day. You That's know, a good deal. Because we went there to hunt. We didn't go there to relax and to proper feet up and get a suntan. We went there to hunt, so we hunted. Yeah. But you didn't have any problem with any military, law enforcement, no. or no. any of the political things that we hear about every day. Something's going on no. someplace in the world. And taking your uh, guns in, uh, the one thing you want to do uh, when you get there, they will. You have a form to fill out with your gun manufacturer, whether it's a Remington or Ruger, whatever, and the serial number and the caliber of it. And you fill that out. You get a copy of that form to keep with you. When you leave there, you have to check your guns in again at the airport. When you check them in, tell them that you want to keep that copy. Uh, and they'll just make a photostatic copy for themselves. And you keep that copy. Um, it's not real critical, but when you land in um, the United States, wherever you land at, when you go through customs, a lot of the time they'll ask you, are those registered guns? Are those your guns? Well, the guns I took were not registered. So the only proof I had they were my guns was that sheet when I signed them into South Africa. So we showed them the sheet, went right through customs, no problem. And we're so. always led to believe that it's always the other countries that outlaw guns, and we we in the United States seem to have the problem with being scared of everything. Yeah. It's weird. It is. <laughs> it's strange. Uh, but when you go down there and you come out of the airport, you pick your guns up, uh, or they'll deliver them over there, depending, and that's where you go. They'll have, they have a, a thing set up right there where you just open up the cases, they'll give you a form to fill out, you sit down there, you fill out, you put the serial numbers of the guns on them and stuff, and it's simple. That's what they're really concerned about, right? Yeah. Simple. Yeah. You cannot take any uh, semi-automatics. Can't take them. Strictly bolt action, breach. Yeah, that's it. Or no semi-automatics. Uh, but other than that, it's simple. Uh, and like I say, you just sign them in and that's it. Uh, and they give you that paper to carry with you while you're down there hunting and you keep it with you while you're hunting. It's very, very simple. Uh, not a problem, not like a lot of people think. Uh, that possibly has changed as a little bit with the 9-11 stuff, but doubtful. Uh, mm -hmm. Because you go through and it's, uh, you know, you're not trying to hide anything, so it's not a problem. It's pretty simple. Right. While you were over there, were you, I may sound kind of stupid, but you know, like, what about dangerous animals like snakes? I mean, they, oh yeah, uh, they got what? puff adders and all that. You got to watch. So we're what talking like one one bite and puff goes a dragon. It's over with. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you got to watch what you're doing. Down where we hunted <clears throat> is more the plains. Uh, you don't have as many of those puff adders, but you do. Uh, you don't have as many snakes, as many bugs. Mm -hmm. uh, the one time when I was going to when I was getting ready to shoot that uh, spring buck. I moved a little rock, oh, maybe that big, out of the way so I could set, get a little better position and yeah. there's a scorpion under it. So mm -hmm. you just kind of hurt him off so he don't bite you in the butt while you're sitting there. But now when you get up in the bush country, you run into a lot more snakes, a lot more spiders because it's getting closer to the equator, it's warmer, and you have a lot more bugs to contend with. But, uh, yeah, there's some stuff that's, you know, puff adders are not nothing to play with. Uh, but you just watch what you're doing, like when, when you're anywhere, you watch what you're doing, you know, pay attention. Were the insects, the bugs, pretty big problem? Or no. no, no. Did they recommend you bring anything, put on your skin, keep them off? Or they didn't recommend. Uh, we just took some uh, deet, <clears throat> take some hundred percent deet with you, and then just deet, huh? Yeah, and then if you got it, you know, if you do have any bug problems, we had we had no bug problems, uh -huh. none. Um, to go back kind of to that house, we got carried away there on that house um, where we stayed at. Uh, Marvin and I had a room, Brett and, and Bruce had a room. We each had our own bed, which was like a double bed, uh, plenty of room. Uh, the first morning when we got up, uh, the gal come around and she wanted to know if we'd uh, slept okay. And Brett said, well, it was a little chilly, but it wasn't bad. And for Marvin and I and Bruce, it was fine. So then we uh, 
come back the next night, or we go hunting and we go in that evening, and you go, you know, sit around, shoot the bull a while, and then you go jump in bed, and they got a nice big old hot rock underneath down there at your foot in the bed. I mean, it was amazing. Told them we didn't need that rock, but Brute, uh, Brett kept the rock every night, but the rest of us didn't. You figured out he was there, might as well use it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, they'll give <clears throat> you a um, different colored plastic, like little wash baskets at the end of your bed. You throw your clothes in it. You get up in the morning, you just go. Throw your clothes in, whatever you're going to, you know, needs mm -hmm. washed. You come back, your bed's all made, your clothes all been washed and folded and laying on your bed every night, every day. I mean, it's, like I say, they take care of you. Man, that's a pretty good deal. You bet. And uh, you don't, uh, if you want anything, you just say something. It don't matter what it is. Uh, when you're sitting around the fire out there, outside, they got a little circle fire thing there. Uh, the refrigerator is probably 30 feet away, and you can't even get up go get a beer, and they got one in your hand if you want to drink a beer or whatever. They don't let you do nothing. I mean, they'll do everything. Uh, some of the animals we helped carry, we helped gut, help load, whatever, depending on the size of them and, and where we's at and all that. Most of the stuff you can, an awful lot of it you can drive pretty close to it. Uh, somehow you can get there, but that's pretty easy. What about communication? I mean, like, someone needed to get a hold of you. I mean, like, phone service, radio service. Obviously, your cell phone's not going to work in that place, but... Uh, um, SATCOM, Leacom? Hein you know. uses a cell phone, and it works. It does? Yes. All right. So they have cell phones with them at all times. So if you need them, they got them. Uh, and then email, uh, Hein has a computer set up at his house for email. Mm -hmm. uh, we stopped there a couple of times and would email back here to the states mm -hmm. um, and then they could email us stuff. Were there like hospitals nearby or uh, a couple? Or? There is in the bigger towns. Okay yeah. and how far away were they? They were quite a ways away. Oh really? Yes. So in other words life-threatening situation better not but, be taking place. Yeah. <laughs> but then uh, see the year after we were there Bruce went back. Uh -huh. And they were up. They were up toward Johannesburg somewhere, and I'm not sure where. Uh, I think I know where they was at. They was probably on real close on the same ranch where we hunted when we was up there. Mm -hmm. uh, and Bruce had poked his eye with his hunting knife. Oh, geez, how they do and that? And his skin and a. Uh, well, he's just bringing it up real hard. And, honey badger. And it punched and through taking, and got he's him. He's taking the claws off a of honey badger. I yeah. Mean, he's, skin in him out to save the claws. Sure. Yeah. And you get down to them little joints, you just pop through them. Sure. It came well, he right went up. through them, and then he got to one, and it wasn't going through the joint, and he's pushing it. Went right in his eye. Oh, his my eye. goodness. And so they jumped in the, and Hine come, he wasn't right there, him and Tabu was there, and Hine come over just a couple of minutes after that, and knew it was a bad deal, so he just got on the cell phone and called into some other outfitter that he knew at Johannesburg, and because Hein isn't that familiar, it's a Johannesburg's a big town, huge. Yeah. And he wasn't familiar how to get to the hospital and stuff. And the out, the other outfitter met him on the edge of town and just took him right through town, right to the hospital. So, well, like he's okay, him. isn't he? He lost his eye. Oh no shit! Yeah. Really? Yeah. But they got they got hospitals. That. They got everything that you need. He's an experienced trapper too. Yep. Yeah. And just one of those weird things that happened. Yeah. And they fixed Man. him up right there at the hospital as best they could. Next morning, he was on a plane back to here. Oh, I didn't and then know. And they that. worked. They took the cornea out and done a bunch of stuff and thought they could save it. And they never could get it to reattach back. And yes. he went through several surgeries trying to get it done, and it ain't working. But he said, "Yeah, one well, of these days, you know, they keep developing stuff. Maybe they can get it to work." So, but they have the stuff available. And when he got back here, the hospital here, the eye doctor said, "Whoever worked on you down there done a." really nice job than a, what he could do. Well, you probably get a lot of experience over the years, different so, things going on down there. So there's that stuff's available. Well, I didn't even know that happened. Yeah. Huh. Wow. So that was a bad deal. So now he shoots left-handed. Well, you see, that's the way it should be. Everybody should be in their right mind shooting left-handed. Yeah, so he shoots left-handed now. <laughs> Just like me. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it Dude. was a bad deal, but, Man, but they do I have the capabilities of stuff. You know, if somebody needs help, they got it. You know, it can be had. 
And if you're way out, I mean, he can call and get a chopper in if they need it. I mean, that's, you know, because the cell phones work. Well, that's better in the United States almost, golly, I'll tell you what. <laughs> it is surprising. Out here, unless you're a millionaire, you just can't seem to get anything done. Yeah. yeah. And the one mm -hmm. thing Hine does, uh, which is good, he has a cell phone, but when you're out stalking animals, he ain't carrying the cell phone, so it's ringing. Well, this is true. It's in the truck, yeah. and he'll check messages later. See, uh -huh. so you know he knows, and he's he's good at it. So. Yeah, well, I was talking earlier about your personal cell phone you got here in the states. That's not going to work over there. <laughs> That's way out of the call area. Uh, anything else you want to say or do? Talk about stories, interesting things. I know you got a bunch of them. I got. I've known many. you for years, I bud. Got too many of them, and the camera ain't lasting that long. Okay. We'll call her quits. And what's the date today? The third day of uh, March 2004. Yep. Well, I thank you, Mr. Bill Kearns. We'll talk to you later. All right.